right, uh, it is 6.30, so we are going to get started. Uh, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, so the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Um, I don't think uh, there's too much to be changed here. Um, we had the possibility of moving the homelessness task force uh, update uh, a little higher in the in the order of things, uh, but there's a, a meeting uh, pertaining to homelessness that's going on that ends at seven. So we certainly won't do it before then. We want anybody who's interested in homelessness to um, be able to get from that meeting to here. So. Uh, that one might move, but uh, but we'll see. And I think um, all the other changes to the agenda are reflected in the online um, version of the agenda. So, um, is there any any other um, thoughts or comments on the agenda? Okay. So without objection, we'll consider the uh, agenda approved. Uh, so on or the next thing is uh, general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any issue that is otherwise not on our agenda. And if you would um, say your name, where you're from, and uh, try to keep your comments to about two minutes, that would be great. That applies um, throughout the, uh, the agenda as well if you have comments about other topics. Um, so if there's any comments, yes. Hi, my name is uh, Dan Richardson. I'm a resident of Montpelier, but uh, I just wanted to simply note that uh, I am a merit badge counselor for citizenship in the community, and there are members of Montpelier's own Troop 709 that are here in the audience, and they are attending to observe a city council meeting as part of their requirements, which is one of the merit badges required for Eagle. So um, if they come in and out of the meeting, it's only because we don't make them stay for the entire uh, duration. But they are very interested. Come on, I want to be an Eagle Scout. You got to be Well, and I also want to acknowledge uh, Bill Frazier has uh, generously uh, volunteered to come to, uh, we have a follow-up meeting on Saturday, and he'll be uh, presenting and talking about some of the issues that the city is facing and give the scouts an opportunity to truly grill him for that. So we really appreciate <laughs> that. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Okay, so uh, we're going to move on to the consent ag uh, agenda. There's only a few items there. Any uh, motion regarding the consent agenda? Move the consent agenda. Second. Okay, further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, uh, so we have uh, uh, appointment to the Housing Authority, and I believe we had uh, one uh, vacant seat and uh, one applicant. And Ed, I see you're here. Do you want to address the council at all? Tell us why, about how things are going or um, anything about the uh, uh, Housing Authority? Thank you for that. Yeah. Good evening. I'm Ed Larson. I have no opening remarks, but I'm willing to answer any questions you may have. <laughs> I've been doing this for uh, 25 years. So why am I doing it for another five years? Well, only because Joanne won't retire. <laughs> and uh, I want to be there when we hire the new person because it's a very important job. And uh, I felt that my experience and longevity would be an asset to that search team. Great. Any questions? <clears throat> okay, thank you. thank you. I move that we uh, appoint Ed Larson to another five-year term on the Montpelier Housing Authority Board. I'll second it. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you so much, Ed. May I add? <laughs> yes. <laughs> now that my good friend, yeah. Mr. McCullough, who I served as his vice chair when he was the chair for many, many years, I am now the longest serving uh, commissioner on the Montpelier Housing Authority wow. in your history. Oh, my wow. goodness. Excellent. Well, thank you for your work. Badge it's for that, hard. man. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, on to the Conservation Commission uh, uh, question about funding. Um, yes, welcome. Hi. Um, hi, so uh, my name is Brenna Toman. I'm a member of the Montpelier Conservation Commission. Um, we want to revive uh, applications processing for uh, the conservation fund. Um, this is a fund that was appropriated in 2002, I think. Um, it was voted in by Montpelier residents. Um, it's about at 39,000 to 40,000, somewhere in, in between there. Um, and this fund is uh, appropriated for purchase of um, lands and waters within Montpelier um, that support recreation, wildlife habitat, um, 
conservation, uh, land, of, of water, um, anything like that. Uh, and it's pretty broad. Um, but as it stands, we don't have a, com a committee to uh, review applications. Um, all of the members that were on the Conservation Commission in 2002 are not on the Conservation Commission anymore. Um, so we have um, elected three members of the Conservation Commission to serve on this subcommittee to review the fund. Um, and we're requesting that uh, City Council uh, advise or advertise to um, two members of the public to serve on this um, committee. Uh, that's how that's written in the, you know, all the stuff from 2002. Um, and it sounds like a great idea. So <laughs> um, we're just hoping we can get two members. Um, and then our next steps will be to review the application. Um, there is one already written from back then. Um, so we'll review, update anything that needs to be updated, bring it to you again, um, and then we'll be open for business. Questions? Uh, Jack. So did you say that we have an application now that was received sometime around 2002? Oh, no, no. Okay. Um, that's when the fund was created, um, and there was a lot of you know paperwork from back then. Um, there's an application, like, not, yeah, there's like an application process a documented. Form? A form, yes, <laughs> um, so. for it. So we just have to update it so that people can apply if they'd like. And then publicize the availability of funds and yes. Okay, thanks. Is the intent with this fund to go out and ask for um, donations from the community, or are you? Is it? Is it that you're asking the, for the city for money, or what's the intent there? Um, well, the the money already exists somewhere in the city's coffers. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. okay. It's already been appropriated, but um, we do intend to use it sort of as leverage, um, as a match potentially for grants um, or for private donors. Um, we don't use, we don't intend to just use that as a standalone. It's not going to get you very far, I think. <laughs> okay. Just by way of background, in 2002, there was a ballot vote to establish a conservation fund just for that one year. It was an annual thing. And I, I think it was one cent on the tax rate or half a cent or something like that. It raised forty or fifty thousand dollars. You know, it was put into a reserve. I think a small amount of it was spent at the time, and there was a they created a committee much like the housing trust fund to receive applications and this council approved this process and it they didn't do much with it, but it's still sitting in as reserved and designated for the conservation fund, so it's still available. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, uh, Donna. I, I, this is for you and Bill. The process then would be you would appoint your three members from, from the Conservation Commission, and then at large are two members. We come from the council. Yes. And so today we would like confirm that and start advertising. Yes. And then the other part, I guess, when you come back with this form, do we get a chance to look at the form? and? Yes, or. yeah, I'll bring you the form. Um, and then also, you all get the final say in awarding right. the fund. We are just going to make a recommendation with the committee. Okay. It's much like the Housing Trust Fund and the other, okay. the, the, the community fund and those kind of things. It works very similarly. Okay. So we're just appointing people to screen yep. the mm -hmm. applications. Yep. They'll manage that and then come in and say, here's what Great. we recommend. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I think we could. Uh, potentially use uh, a motion to uh, post two at-large uh, positions to serve on the Conservation Fund subcommittee. Is that sufficient? I think that's probably all you need from us, right? Yeah. Okay. So moved. <laughs> well, second. Okay, further discussion. Uh, okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. And so I assume that if we post it roughly tomorrow, then uh, I mean we've got Thanksgiving coming up, so we probably wouldn't have uh, applications done until probably the first week one of December. One of the December or, meetings, or, yeah. yeah. Okay. We have two meetings in December back to back, uh, okay. so it would be one of those meetings. Either. Okay. Probably the 11th and 18th, I think. Great. The two dates. Skipping Christmas. Yeah, we could do it on the 25th. <laughs> <laughs> you all chose not to when we set the schedule, but okay. you call the meeting, we'll be here. 
Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much um, for all your energy and putting that to get together. Uh, okay, so uh, we're going to uh, go to the Social and Economic Justice um, Advisory Committee and update. Is not here she's here. Oh, she's here. Perfect. Just oh, great. Make a time. <laughs> we can also switch switch things around if if you need to. Do you have five minutes to catch your breath? Um, And just as you're all uh, coming up here, um, the I had thought about moving the homelessness task force update sooner, uh, but it's still only 6:40. It's been 10 minutes since we started. My goodness! Right. Rocket oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna keep my mouth shut about that. Um, in any case, so we might just leave it where it is and just uh, go from there. So hopefully everyone can can be here who wants to be here for that. All right, well, welcome. If you want to introduce yourselves and uh, tell, us, tell us about uh, what's going on. Great. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Shana Casper. I live on Kent Street, and I'm here with the Social and Ad Economic Justice Advisory Council. <coughs> I'm Jamie Carroll. I'm a staff representative. Michael Sherman, Montpelier resident. Julia Schaefitz, Montpelier resident. Cool. Um, so uh, we're before you today to request funding um, for social and economic justice assessment project. So the Montpelier City Council um, created the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, which we call CJAC, um, with an important, ambitious, and far-reaching charge of tackling systemic oppression and working toward greater equity and justice for all residents. Um, and we have this charge that we can share, um, but it's also available on our website where it's been shared. Great. Um, so the committee has been really diligently meeting on, on this charge for a little over a year. And for much of this time, we've struggled with the question of what is expected from us, from the council, and how to successfully achieve this far-reaching goals that are laid out in this charge. And so in order to accomplish the charge, must take a really proactive role in gathering and assessing information concerning perceptions, experiences, and recommendations of a wide range of Montpelier residents in regard to the impact of the city government's policies and practices on economic, social, and racial justice, and specifically the perspectives of those who are most impacted by any inequity. So we have, while we, we have a de dedicated group of volunteers serving on the committee, not all of whom could be here tonight, um, we do not have in-house expertise on how to effectively facilitate the challenging and important community discussions. And further, the volunteers do not currently represent the broad swath of the demographics of our community. As we have heard from experts in the field and from folks in our community with lived experience, this work can ha cause harm if not done skillfully by experienced facilitators. And we've heard feedback that leads us to believe that we are on the path of causing harm from individuals and to the relationship between city government and its residents, regardless of our positive intentions. So to this end, uh, the committee recently contacted several individuals and organizations who have expertise in conducting or guiding programs that address economic, social, and racial justice. And we have learned from these discussions that to be successful, this must be a shared responsibility guided by experienced facilitators, uh, but include a core group of diverse Montpelier city residents and implemented over the course of two to three years. Other Vermont communities, including Brattleboro, Hardwick, Winooski, um, have undertaken similar processes with consultants. Um, so we hope that by undertaking this important project, um, we will, one, be able to recruit more volunteers and a more diverse group of individuals to set direction for this committee. Two, uh, facilitate discussions that will yield useful information and recommendations concerning economic and social justice for our community. And three, establish a precedent for and structure for ongoing communication about equity among residents and between residents and city government officials and staff. Um, our proposed plan for implementing this project includes uh, issuing an RFP um, for, for three main reasons. So one, uh, to help the committee plan and implement processes and structures for engagement that have proven effective at least uh, at, at respectfully including people of uh, who are most affected by in inequity. Uh, two, 
provide some level of training for local leadership, and three, provide ongoing oversight, participation, and guidance in gathering, summarizing, and assessing the information we might acquire in order to provide effective and useful advice to the City Council, um, as stated in our committee's name and charge. We have been advised that the cost for these services would be at least $10,000 a year for potentially two to three years. We therefore come to you to request approval to issue a request for proposal with the understanding that we will be seeking from Council an appropriation of at least $10,000 for the fiscal year of 2021. Uh, to contract with local uh, organizational or individual experts to provide the training, planning support, analysis, and guidance as described above. Um, so we anticipate that we will have to return to City Council for similar funding in FY22 and perhaps FY23. And if we seek to undertake additional work beyond this initial contracted amount, we would be communicating uh, to assist the city's community development specialist to work to raise additional funds as necessary. We recognize that this request presents the city council with a significant challenge in a year when other obligations are already putting pressure on the city's budget. Um, we do believe, however, that this project is critically important for accomplishing the goals of planning for and implementing the policies and practices that will provide economic, social, and racial justice for all of those who live, work, and visit our city. As the City Council prioritized in establishing this committee, um, and we believe that this appropriation will be an investment in the future of our city that will benefit us all. And we also believe that without this funding, our committee will not be able to continue uh, as currently designed and charged. So um, we want to open it up and to see what questions folks have. Um, but before that, any anything else? Okay. Thank you, Shana. I, I just um, I think this is a uniquely challenging um, committee or, or charge, and I, I just want to recognize that. We have been doing this for over a year, and the three people sitting here have stuck through it. And um, it's been challenging, it's been uncomfortable, and the work they have done is has just blown me away, and their dedication, um, despite all of the challenges we've had. So thank you so much. Thank you uh, for your work in, in all of this. Uh, uh, comments or questions? Uh, Ashley, um, so I apologize that I came in after you had started right presenting. Right we were starting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> All right. It wasn't late for everything. Um, so this is something I'm super glad to see this request before us. This is something that I have felt pretty strongly about through my entire time on the council here, and just um, you know paying attention to even language is so critical as we figure out how we are going to identify as a community and how we're going to move forward. Um, and to me, this is absolutely where city money must be invested. Um, you know, I know that there are other budget constraints, but I'm not super interested in Blue Cross Blue Shield getting their 25% before we make sure that our people are cared for in our community and that our people are welcome in our own community where we all live. And so this to me is a really, really good start. Just, just even to bring somebody in to like help us as a community figure out how we talk about you know, how we talk about diversity and how we really make sure that we don't sort of drown out all of the other really important things that are happening because we get so focused on our own perceptions and perspectives. So thank you. Other thoughts? Uh, Donna. Well, I was glad that you read a lot more than we had received in our packet, because I was wondering <coughs> what the scope of the RFP, I just didn't get it from the little summary. Because I also wanted us to do some community awareness workshops, and you're right, there are experts out there that can come in. Do you have any kind of an outline for your RFP? We don't yet. Um, we've talked to about three um, potential consultants who have slightly different processes around what, this, what their scope would be. Um, so of what would be covered in the RFP, we haven't written out yet. But 
Um, yeah, do you want to? I think we were. I think we were directed to ask first um, whether just to find out what uh, before we spend. No, no. Resources, so. Just w one <laughs> um, of the tilts is an RFI, which we did for the multi, uh, micro transit, and vendors actually came and presented how they would deal with it. Just so we gave them sort of the end product we wanted, and they each made their own proposal and scope of cost. So you might want to also look at it from that point of view if the council decides to go forward. We, we did talk about that, and, and one of the things that uh, we learned is that um, consultants in this field are really protective of their intellectual property, and so we, we sort of did our <laughs> request for information, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's really, if this is something that council is committed to, um, then I guess we would, you know, we would ask for their proposal. Um, you know, it, am I ex explaining it right in terms of their, I think so, their yeah. how they felt about this? Does that make sense? Yeah. Other questions? <coughs> Glenn? Um, well, again, thank you. Uh, I think it, it makes a lot of sense to me that uh, a topic like this if we ask, if we form a, a committee to, to, to work out all the problems uh, and they work at it for a year and then they come back and say these problems will actually take some money to, to work on, that is uh, not unexpected. It's <laughs> too bad, but I, I get it. I guess I'm, I'm curious if, if you have any information now about um, you said that there were other communities in Vermont who have done similar things, uh, hired consultants for this sort of purpose. Do you have any any uh, narratives about outcomes from those places or any any further details about that you could share at this point? Yeah, I can share about the Winooski one. We've heard a lot about that because they just wrapped up in like April or May. Um, but it was a very intensive, um, like six week process, bringing together a lot of the different communities in the city that had um, uh, been raising some of these concerns to the city. Um, so, largely including a large amount of like uh, uh, parents and school officials with city officials. Um, and their biggest outcome coming out of that was basically forming a committee like we already have, um, but that uh, that it, it is better set up and has better representation and better commitment and buy-in from city staff and from the community writ large by having these, you know, months of, um, of of uh, discussions, of community-wide discussions, um, that they were able to, um, you know, so they, they just started this a couple a couple of months ago now, um, but that uh, it's, I we heard just glowing reviews about what the process was like for them just to be able to come together and have these really open and honest and frank conversations about these really tough issues under kind of a, a third party um, facilitation. Jack? Yeah. Um, <coughs> do we, uh, is, is it reasonable to think that we can put together and put out uh, RFP and then get responses in time to uh, get it into the uh, appropriation process for discussion? I don't know how long something like that takes. Well, I, I think what it really is is, you know, we want to know if you're willing to do this, you know, and, and at, that, at that point then we can, you know, really hit the ground running and, and see what we can do. It's, we're at this point where, you know, we, it's, it's this or, or nothing, frankly. And so do we, you know, keep going and, and doing this work and asking other people to tell us what they're doing without paying them um, for nothing, you know. So to answer your question, I think the estimate they received was about $10,000 to the various people that they need for this year and possibly subsequent years. 
And so the question, you know, so I guess the direction to provide them is either go ahead and we'll commit to putting the money in the budget now or we're in favor of this but don't go do any RFPs until after we've completed the budget to see if it makes it through because we haven't weighed that all in yet. And I'll just, I'll weigh into the earlier question as well. I spoke to um, people in Winooski and Hartford and Brattleboro and they all had similar processes and I think um, both Brattleboro and Hartford are also very eager to share their experiences with us as well and learn, you know, learn from all three of them what went well and what didn't and how we can, you know, prove. But they all f generally felt very positive about the work. I guess. Yeah, Can go I ahead. Ask just a procedural question. Sure. So if, if one were to make a motion and we were to vote on that to include it in the budget, is that is that the sort of kind of commitment that the committee would need or is that so I, I think that, so this is, this is uh, sort of where I'm coming from. Probably a, a vote to include it in the budget right now would probably be premature. We probably need to have that as a part of the uh, discussion together with the budget. Um, my sense is that um, we should, well, there, I, I guess I see three possible um, ways to move forward. And you, you sort of just outlined them, Bill. Um, one is to say, we don't want to do this. This is not worth pursuing. Option two is uh, this is worth pursuing. We'd like to um, talk about it with the budget, but don't do anything until we've uh, officially um, included it in the budget, which would be um, sometime in January. And the third option would be, yes, it's worth pursuing. Um, uh, we'll, we'll discuss it as a part of the budget, but go ahead and, and seek um, you know, more information or start moving forward um, with your process. Um, and I, I'm um, open to either of the second two. I, I'd prefer, <laughs> uh, and because it, 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 this is this is really uh, valuable, and I think um, much needed work uh, in our community. And I think this would be a great way to move forward. Um, speaking for myself, but uh, other thoughts on how to move, or, or if there's other options that I haven't really thought of, that's fine too. I'm, I'm going to go Donna and then Lauren. Unless is that okay? Okay. But we could make a motion now. And we, we could. could commit ourselves we could. outside of the whole process because I felt this is where it should started with some level of community yeah. workshop. I just agree. didn't know how you could sit down and do it without it. Uh, kudos that you tried. Uh, so <laughs> I, I think, you know, we have, instead of jump starting, we sort of said, okay, go do it. And I think we need this. So it's not going to happen. And we need to start it sooner than later. So I'll make a motion that we commit $10,000 for um, this project to move forward. Second. OK, fair enough then. <laughs> uh, Lauren, did you have something to add? Um, yeah, I mean, so I have been serving on the committee for the past, since March. Since you started, since yeah. Since I started here. Um, and first, just wanted to express my really, really deep gratitude to the people sitting here and the other people who have been participating. Uh, this, I mean, trying to figure out where to begin with racial justice, social and economic justice, with a, an extremely expansive charge, um, and a, basically a bunch of volunteers coming out to try to figure out where to even begin with these kind of humongous societal, structural, systemic issues, and the amount of dedication, heart, emotion, and hard work that um, these volunteers have brought to it is just so laudable and so appreciated. And so I, I'm just so grateful for that. Um, and I think the work to figure out, okay, how do we go forward? And I'm just, I'm so glad that the council um, seems to agree that, that moving forward with bringing in um, experts who can really help us and so that we can do this right and do it well for our community and make sure that we're hearing from the people who you know don't tend to show up at council meetings and aren't part of the process unless we figure out a really deliberate way to engage them. And I hope that that will really inform, you know, as we look at our, pro our priorities for the coming years, that we're able to hear from people who are um, not engaged right now and really look at how we're um, improving equity. So I'm really glad and heartened to hear a, a strong commitment. And I think that um, this group really needs that. If we were to even today say, go forth, I, I would hate to say go forth and do more work without a commitment because I think 
they're kind of at a point of either tell us to, to do it and let's do it or let's go home and save ourselves the kind of the challenging work that we've been doing. So um, I'm eagerly going to vote for this motion. And again, thank you to the folks who've been participating. Any other comments? Um, I guess I, I, I'm nervous about, uh, you know, having a budget decision outside of the budget process, but I get it. This is, this is very important. So, um, fair enough. Uh, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for your work, and uh, that'll be in the budget. Can I say one more thing? Oh, for sure. Um, I, I just, I'm like close to tears, um, because that's not how I thought this was going to go. Um, and this has been a really hard year um, and change. I was the reluctant chair of this committee. Um, and um, I'm, I'm really grateful. I, I, I kind of wish I had known we could have come to you earlier, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, don't push it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we needed to go through this in order to get here. Um, but I, I do want to say that I, I um, we started last August with no charge and no clear role for, um, for members. And that was not a good way to start this work. <laughs> Um, and I just, I, I think it's really important that you all consider that as you move forward with other committees and other um, decisions that you make. I, I commend you all for being, like, it's nice to know that you're all kind of in our corner. Because <laughs> um, I, I don't know that we knew. And uh, I just want you to think carefully as you move forward with other, other processes. I, hearing you say that, that you kind of saw the need for the community conversations first, that would have been a really great way to start this work. Um, and I just want to put a pin in that for you um, as you think about other things. Because it's um, it this process has been, you know, I think personally stressful, but also I think um, the whole group has gone through a lot. Um, and we've lost a couple members who, who I mean, frankly, felt like it was, um, for lack of a better term, violent to be in the meetings. Mm -hmm. Um, because of the lack of clarity around things like racial justice. And um, th that's sort of what we refer to in the statement when, when uh, we said that, that harm can be done when this work is not done well. Um, it can be done well intended. Um, but when it's not done well and expertly, it causes harm. And we have harmed individuals in the process. And um, I just think that's really, it's important to keep in mind moving forward. So thank you, thank you, like from the, deeply, <laughs> thank you for, for being unanimous on that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, again, thank you all for your work. Okay, um, I'm gonna um, just check in with Ken. It's after seven o'clock. Um, okay. If, all right, so all right, so we're gonna um, jump to the homelessness task force update, and we'll do the um, uh, natural resources uh, ordinance public hearing after that. So we're just gonna flip flop those two agenda items. Well, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we'll introduce ourselves, but um, we appreciate the opportunity to be here in front of you um, as representatives of the Homelessness Task Force. I'm Cameron Niedermeyer. I'm the staff support for this committee. I'm John Little. Uh, Ken Russell. Um, so we're here today to sort of present to you sort of an overview of what we've done so far, what our immediate recommendations would be and our ask from you tonight, and then we'll talk a little bit about our long-term goals. Um, so Ken's going to kick us off. Uh, we've been working really well together. It's, it really is um, heartening work. I go, I go into these meetings feeling well, a little anxious at the beginning, and I'm just truly amazed at the talent and the expertise and the care around the table and the commitment to addressing some really thorny issues. Um, and um, and we, we, you'll see in the report there's a scope of things from big to small um, but we definitely try to focus on what's achievable, 
um, with limited resources, but also with an eye towards um, everyone understanding the depth of the problem and uh, what longer term solutions might look like. Um, so to that end, we're, we're starting off with you know, some practical uh, achievements and asks. Um, thank you so much for opening the shelter earlier. I think you probably all noticed uh, how cold it was in those first two weeks of November. And, um, and I drive around the streets at night and I'm driving in my comfortable car and I, it's always like there are people out there right now. And how would our thinking change if somebody didn't make it through the night one of these nights? So we, we try to bring that sense of urgency to the problem. I'm Donna. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, being realistic, and it's sort of like we, we, we want to be able to solve all these problems right away, snap our fingers. Um, an example of one of these problems, which is so, in which John can speak to in a minute, but I just I, it, it's an example of it's in our mid range objectives, but it, we're thinking about it immediately, which is. Um, connecting somebody, they, they, get, they might find out at 6 o'clock at night they can't be in the shelter or 8 o'clock at night. And then there may be motel subsidies available, but they had to have been at the office by the close of business day at 4.30 in Barrie. They have to get back to Barrie. So we're like looking at how can we facilitate transportation? How can we work with um, uh, people administering these programs to have them be more efficient and streamlined? There's a restructuring of of the emergency housing program on a statewide level, so very well next year might be capstone administering the, the local aspect of that. Um, we were looking at, at lockers, placing the lockers, and you know it's a simple concrete solution for for the, for those not aware. It's sort of like people have sleeping bags taken. Um, there are donations coming in. All the donations are appreciated by the community. Um, but then they get stolen. So, and, I, and I'm really glad Don is here to speak to what it's like out there. Um, but I, it's just, it's good work. Um, we have, you know, a mission of, of have, reaching everybody and everybody's housing, everybody deserves to be in, in good housing. Um, we have some, some numbers here um, in Washington, in Vermont, as of January 2018. Of course, all these numbers are best guesses. 1,291 residents um, on any given day. Um, Don at one point had a number of 42. But for the for the city of Montpelier, it was around 45 people, and this is the the individuals change a bit here and there, but the number remains about the same. This does not include couch surfers, people who manage to get inside, whether it's from one night to the next on somebody's couch or in someone's garage, or people who are doubled up in apartments. So that doesn't take that part of the population into consideration at all. So uh, I just want to make sure I heard the right. So Montpelier has a pop uh, homeless um, uh, folks who are struggling with homelessness, uh, about 45, um, generally pretty constantly. It's, it's fairly constant. It, okay. It's perhaps higher than that in the spring and summer. Okay. But as of late fall, um, we compared notes with agencies, with outreach people, and with actual homeless people. And that's basically the number we came up Okay. With. Thank you. Um, so we, we are requesting asking um, most graciously um, to consider extending the shelter hours in the spring um, when we had initially brought that up I remember I remember Bill saying why well, I assume you're gonna want the spring too um, and yes we do <laughs> so, I'm sorry um, we, we would like to shelter I'll use that one testing one two three um, so we would like the shelter, we're asking humbly if you could extend the shelter hours in the spring, similar to what you had done in the fall, um, recognizing your budget constraints. Um, and we're frankly think it's a good idea every year, um, but we will come back with more details on that bef before your December <coughs> budget conversations begin. Um, so I'm gonna take a look at the Okay. 
So just to clarify, um, we're asking to take the $10,000 that were already identified for the Homelessness Task Force for this year, for this fiscal year, and just extend their use for extending the opening of Good Sam Shelter in the Bethany Church. So this funding would go to Good Sam and not any of the Homelessness Task Force initiatives at this time other than that. So we're just asking it for it to be extended at least two weeks in the spring, so it would be the same cost from this side. In the, in the winter, which I think was five grand for two weeks into the spring. Okay. Uh, Jack and Ashley. And so I, I think you may have just asked my, answer my question. Do we know how much of the city funds that we allocated has been drawn down for the early start? They opened a little later than they anticipated, so it was a little less than that $5,000 ask okay. in the beginning. I don't have an exact number at this time. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ashley, anything further? Um, I. So my understanding of the council left it was that it was this was money for the shelter. And so from at least from my perspective about how we left it, that money was for the shelter. And I absolutely support using whatever is left of that money to to keep it open longer in the spring. Um, and uh, but I I again, I think that. The, the sort of bigger piece here is what are we going to do more long term, which I know is always the, the sort of big question, but I love to see that that we, we are identifying finally those sort of gaps between like if, if you qualify here and you can't get to where you need to be to get that that piece of paper that you need. And, you know, I work in the court system, so I see this every single day. and. Um, I just want to put on the radar, so on the news a few weeks ago, the CAHOOTS program that started out of Eugene, Oregon. Um, and I had sent the email around. I think, Ken, I may have sent it to you. I know I sent it to the council. I also sent it to the city of Barrie. Um, and what CAHOOTS does, it's a uh, basically a mobile social worker unit that can work with communities to identify um, unmet needs. They also partner with uh, law enforcement, local law enforcement, to, um, to sort of see if this is a situation that warrants a law enforcement response. Um, and they also help to, um, or at least the program model is, is predicated on sort of filling that gap between the, oh my gosh, I know I can't, now I know that I can't get a bed here tonight, but I have to get to the emergency, you know, housing um, office, you know, in, in downtown Barrie, there's not a bus that I can get. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's really sort of that like community driven hub and spoke model that sounds like it would address some of those sort of questions of what are we going to do about logistics because you know we're Vermont and everything is spread out and you have to be able to get from Montpelier to Barrie or to Burlington or wherever. So that aligns with some of our long-term goals. So I'm going to let Dawn sort of go into our short-term successes and what we've done so far and then we'll talk a little bit about how we've approached that mid-range and long-term program and how that might fit into this that work that we're already doing. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So I would also <laughs> like to ask that you um, sort of continue our charge. We'd like to continue to meet. We think we're doing really good work. And the sort of um, makeup of this group is very unique. We have a lot of really interested and committed and um, uniquely qualified members of our community to speak to these issues in a lot of different ways that we don't often get to hear the voices of. So we're, we are asking also that you very officially let us continue our work. As I, so you would like a motion about that? Or just to continue our charge. We, we will come back with further recommendations. I know we would like to be involved in the budget process for next year as well. We will have some more of those long-term costs that don't include opening the shelter. So we will be back in December to talk about some of our long-term budget asks. So I, I I don't. I, th I think this actually might be a really salient point because I don't know that we ever made a formal motion to form a standing committee. Did I, I thought? Well, I we formed a committee, but we did ask them to come back to us. Right. And so I, I suppose if we just formalized it as a standing, as as sort of an ongoing thing, as opposed to something that sprung up out of. Right. Um, so I, at this point, then would move that we transition or or, or maintain the um, homelessness task force uh, as a standing city committee. I think it's a really, really important voice in government that we desperately need. We desperately need to hear from people who are living, you know, the situations that that our system is supposed to meet that clearly isn't. 
Second. Um, Donna? Do we have for sure that we didn't set up this committee? I mean, I just don't want to make a motion now. Are we going to change their mission, or are we? I think they're just asking to continue the same right. mission. But, committee was but I didn't see a finite date in the first one, so I'm just trying to understand why we're doing that. I think it was the first one was sort of this idea came to the city and there was an ask like we want to do this so we said sure we'll form a task force but I sort of want the message to be clear that this is actually like a long term part of city government yeah. I don't think it hurts okay but I just want you to know from my point we could, we made a committee long term but anyway fine we, we like the afterwards Okay. Okay. Well, there's been a, a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Thank you. So, so I, I just want to make sure that Don, Don's perspective, I mean, if you could describe what you do and what you see the gaps. And, and um, I think that, well, I think that I'd like to say first that I think the task force, as Cameron said, does pre present a unique opportunity because we have people coming from different segments of the service and other populations of the area, we have, we're bringing together a number of different perspectives. Um, my perspective on this is that I've been doing street outreach in the Montpelier, and basically in Washington County for several years now, and one of my focuses has been on the gaps in the existing system and on the barriers that people face in using existing services. And that's one of, the, you know, one of the main things that the task force needs to deal with. What are the barriers? How do we reach the people who aren't reached by the system? And that's another reason that we'd like to continue, because it's fairly complex. We also hope to bring together a really diverse group of service providers, work with them in order to make sure that the resources are as effective as possible, that they reach as many people as efficiently as possible. And I think that continuing will allow us to do that. Um, so yeah, my, my perspective again has been to look at the gaps and to deal pretty much with everyone out there, but particularly concentrating on the people with the greatest number of, or the most challenging barriers to accessing service. And often those are the people who are at greatest risk of death or bodily injury for being outside. And they're often people who are banned from existing services or people who are unable to tolerate being around other people and thus are unlikely to use the existing services. Um, some people have medical issues, some people have substance abuse issues, some people have trauma or psychological issues, um, some people have been in prison or have anxiety and cannot tolerate being around other people. Um, others have disabilities that make it virtually impossible for them to meet <coughs> behavioral standards that are necessary for the safety of the people who run the services and the other people who use them. So part of the complexity of this sort of ongoing charge is to look at these things and try to find solutions that are going to work for everyone without you know endangering other parts and the other the other way to address this is to look and this is mid to long term issues is to look at ways of supporting these people so that they may fit into this and that's that's a real challenge um, and that's that's not a short term thing so but one of the I guess if we look at the short-term project updates, which we seem to be doing, um, one of the things that we're, we're doing is sort of a resource survey and looking at gaps in the system. One of them was warming shelters, and I think the task force has been helpful in clarifying that because initially there was confusion about whether they were only for guests of the Bethany Overflow. It turns out that other people are able to utilize them. Now, there are still people who cannot or will not, but that has increased the number of people utilizing the warming spaces. Um, so I think we've, we've facilitated communication among the different entities that are trying to work together on this, resulting in sort of a clear message about who can do this and who can't, and that has brought more people in, into the shelters. If I can uh, uh, interrupt you here, I think there were a couple of comments or questions. If we go Lauren, then Jack. Okay. Um, yeah, I just had one question. Um, so it's it's great to see all this work, and it does sound like really impressive expertise and important perspective. So I'm so glad we're um, continuing it um, indefinitely. I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around um, for 
how much do you see of um, the role of the city government? How much do you see recommendations that are us advocating to the state for certain services? Like, is this something that you're looking at recommendations that will span both and maybe we try to find other communities to partner with an advocacy also to um, state resources and services? I mean, so it's is, both that you're... This is, again, at. part of the reason that some of these are medium term and long term is that we need to we really need to get a clear picture from all of the people involved. And this is not just the city, it's not even just the providing agencies, it's community members, you know, who knows. And it, it also involves looking at existing strategies in other areas and seeing what has worked for them, running that by existing providers and seeing who might want to pick up on some of those ideas. So yes, absolutely, any potential source, we want to look at that and see how it might fit together in the best way. And let me tag on there. I, I, I mean, it's great to have Will Eberly on our committee. Um, he can just he can lay out this alphabet soup of all the ag agencies that are out there. So there's a role of navigating what's out there. There's a role of just getting you know, people in their silos and where are the gaps and the people between those things. And then there's a whole dynamic with different entities protecting their mission and their budgets. And and so I mean, we I think. We had a conversation today a little bit about private fundraising. Um, we're like, okay, maybe if someone needs a taxi ride down to Barry to the motel, we could raise some money around that. But we, but there's 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 competition for funding for these different agencies. So I, I think the good news in all that is, uh, just as Don was saying, because we're we're working together, there there feels to be some real synergy in all of this. Um, just just by communicating with the people who are out there and understanding. I mean, we're just going through. The, like the, the warming shelter calendar um, and where are the gaps in that. Um, I was just, well, some of us were at the, you know, you too, at the Faith, for VIA, Vermont Area Faith Action, and you can see those people coordinating, and, and there was something like the, the amount of warming shelter beds have tripled in the last three years in Washington County. So, but, the, but as you rightly point out, the goal is to end homelessness. And so there's still, and more homeless people have come to, apparently come to Washington County than other places in Vermont. So our proportion of, of, of the total statewide population of unhoused individuals has gone from something like 8% to 13% over so many years. So maybe it's because we're providing, you know, we're providing services. Um, so the things are growing. I think, I think that's, Partly very true, but to be honest, I think one other factor is that over the past couple of years, there's been a great effort in Washington County to increase the accuracy of the surveys. In the past, the pit count was necessarily limited because it is a point in time count. It, this is, and there are variables. If it's exceptionally bad weather, people may crawl into garages. They may not come out, you know, in time to be counted. And we've, I think a lot of the agencies and the street outreach people have made a huge effort to go out and find people so that we can be more accurate in the numbers. And I believe that has increased the numbers. But I also believe that you know the numbers are increasing and, and there may be more people coming here. So I'm gonna transition us into, because I think there's a couple questions about our mid-range and long-term goals and how we are moving forward with this work. Um, before we do that, J Jack, did you have any particular questions? Yeah, the other day, Ken and I were talking about the uh, coordination and rationalization of some of the services, and one of the things I didn't, it has never occurred to me that someone who's, who's banned from the shelter in Barry would also be banned from getting services over here, and neither one of us knew how many people that actually might be, and I wonder if uh, you've had the uh, ability to find that out. We have actually scheduled a meeting among providers to using unique identifiers to compare all of our lists of both the people that are being served, the people who are out there, and the people who are banned from specific resources. So we should, in another week or so, have a really good number, you know, the best one we can come up with on that. Great, thanks. So that's one of our exciting, like, short-term goals that we really have is not violating anybody's privacy rights, not violating any HIPAA agreements with any organization, but coming together and really coordinating the efforts between other organizations to make sure we have an accurate count of folks who are experiencing homelessness and have really intense barriers to getting housing in our community. So we're not going to be able to move forward if we don't have an accurate census of, of who is in our community, because then we won't know what resources we'll need to uh, address it. 
So some of our longer mid-range goals is really working on those acute needs and working with the continuum of care and other agencies and really working with the integration and interoperability of other agencies that are out there. Um, there are a lot, as Ken already mentioned, a lot of groups who are doing this work and we think it's very important to work with them and not against them or compete with them in any way. We also want to make sure that we identify the most acute needs and the gaps. We've already been working on that. I think Don has a really good handle on what those gaps are. I'll let her talk about those in just a second. I'm going to monopolize the mic for just a second. And then um, really making sure that those needs, when we've identified them, could be something that an organization might be able to take on. We might be able to help them with that. Um, we might be able to raise funding um, externally to the city to get them to do that service. So we also want to look at expanding the shelter services and doing a really good evaluation of our winter shelter system and how that works. We're gonna make it through this season, see how that works and see what gaps we have there as well and what recommendations we can make to the um, community at large and the providers at large to, to address those gaps. We also wanna make sure that we do a housing availability survey working with the continuum of care what's available in our community, what is affordable in our, and accessible in our community, and what that looks like for the folks who are um, experiencing homelessness. And before I get into our sort of more lofty long-term goals, I do want Dawn to talk about some of the gaps that she's identified and that we've worked on. Yeah, there are a couple of other short-term accomplishments, I think, in addition to facilitating the communication between the agencies and getting that word out and get opening the good SAM has been wonderful. It has been utilized. I've seen people there that I didn't think I would ever see inside, frankly, and that's been wonderful. I think due to the, the extreme weather that we had for a couple of days, more people have come in. Um, opening good SAM shelter, because for capacity, reasons of capacity, they have, I guess it's roughly a 20 person capacity and it's been well utilized. We've had good reports from the Bethany Church about their feelings about how it's being run, which is wonderful. Um, there are still people who are out there who are not compatible with that, and that's one of the things we're working on is looking into what the reasons are and what possible solutions might be. Um, the other thing we are looking at for people who are outside is storage availability, not for all of their possessions, but for really vital supplies like sleeping bags, tents, pads, just the things they need to survive overnight. And there has been a problem with things being stolen. We have identified, we, we got a couple, we've got some lockers and we've identified another source for lockers. We would like to set up something so that we, there's no redundancy and people aren't stuck in the middle of the night when it's, you know, zero degrees out without anything. So that's something that we, we are, we are working on. We're halfway to that one. Um, the other thing is, as a result of the existence of the task force, there's been sort of increased awareness of some of the issues. That has resulted in donations from people. We have, before the shelter opened, homeless people in Montpelier received 10 tents, 14 sleeping bags, five camping pads, half a dozen hoodies, um, contractor bags to keep the sleeping bags dry, which is an issue given all the precipitation we've had and given the, you know, um, and also, also we received containers for distributing food donations in the evening in Montpelier before <coughs> the warming shelters opened. Um, and that's, that's still an ongoing, it's not, a, it's not a constant thing, but there are still food donations for people who are, who are outside, who are in the area. Um, as Ken mentioned, the, there is a gap with the transportation, which is partly an immediate issue as it relates to the adverse weather conditions. We did get the news today. It's my impression that the 211 people got increased funding, which is wonderful because they were, they were shutting down at 8 and the shelters were opening at 8, so by the time you knew whether there was a vacancy, it was too late to call them. And apparently that issue has resolved itself, which is wonderful. Um, we still have the transportation issue, which pops up again in the medium and long term gap. So we, we've gotten supplies out. We're trying to identify the gaps. We're trying to find <laughs> solutions for these small, sometimes very inexpensive things that make a huge difference to people. 
So some of our long-term recommendations, as Don was uh, referring to, um, really are going to be looking at more systemic approaches and how the city can really interact with those systemic approaches. We've already um, mentioned looking at affordable and accessible housing, um, coordination of area programming, but also looking for innovative and um, increased support from the city. We've identified already, including ourselves in the city plan, and what that looks like and what our perspective can be um, in that process. And then also looking at our interactions with the Housing Trust Fund and how we can best use that or best recommend uses for that. We also are planning on using a national um, resource that I've included in the report um, that you all have received that uh, from the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, they have a really great guide that has a lot of questions that will guide our thinking on these long-term systemic issues. And really, we're looking forward to bringing those to you and to your attention. Just as a matter of logistics, uh, in the city plan, are you picturing um, uh, perhaps homelessness being its own chapter, or is it a sub-chapter of housing, or how do you envision that? I couldn't answer that question, okay, um, I think, accurately right now. I think that's, okay. that was honestly it's one of those things that we put out as a discussion, and we're really looking forward to seeing how we feel like we could fit into that. Okay, great. Uh, Ashley, did you have a question? I was just, um, I was also sort of reflecting as we sit here in the state capitol, and um, I love that that tonight this is the second committee that we've heard from that is really focused on like doing the hard work. Um, and, you know, I have spent uh, the bulk of my career working with um, folks who are in various stages of transition in their life, whether it's um, into the criminal legal system or out of hopefully, um, you know, whether it's uh, into housing with their families or unfortunately, you know, whether it's sort of losing a little bit of footing. Um, and, and I would just highlight too that as the capital city, we have a real, you know, we have a wealth of resources um, and not just cash resources. Cash is, is super helpful, but um, I would really encourage all of us to sort of think about this as the legislative session starts gearing up too, because there are going to be a lot of um, questions and really tough decisions that they're going to be thinking about. And um, these, to me, are the most important questions. What is the what does the health of our population look like? And you know, when when we see an increase in homelessness and we see um, increases in other indicators that. Uh, tell us that things are not going in the direction that we want them to, um, it, it becomes really important to, to grab attention. And I think we have a really unique position as the capital to really do this. So I love, I'm, I'm so grateful to hear that we're really, you know, talking about the things that everybody knows are problems, but we're actually working on solving them, not just talking about them some more. Uh, Connor. Yeah, I think sort of piggybacking off Ashley and Lauren, you know, the state has failed in their obligation to like properly fund community mental health. Yes. I think they failed in their obligation <laughs> to fund substance abuse services. And I'm just thinking as we look at short term goals here, is there some thought to maybe having an activism component to this committee where you could set a legislative agenda, track the bills in progress? We're playing with like hay pennies and shillings in city government here. But to get like a mental health worker that we share between Barry and Montpelier would have such a real and immediate impact. And to be able to activate a network like you already have there, to go to these hearings, testify, make phone calls to legislators, I think it could be a really powerful thing yes. that you do in a month's time here. So I'm happy to help on any of that. Thank you, we appreciate that. And we will, we will look at adding that to our proposals. Donna, did you have something? Well, I just wonder if there were any restrictions of city <laughs> committees when it comes to lobbying legislatures. I think as long as uh, <coughs> as long as it's consistent with the policy vision of the city, um, certainly staff can and, and city people can, and as individuals, of course, they're more than welcome to do so. But I think uh, if if the, the committee's established a plan and the council's on board with that plan and they're seeking resources to support that plan, um, there's no reason why they can't. Okay, so they we would ultimately though see what they were planning to do as far as lobbying. Well, I, you said they have a plan. Well, we'll I, I meant the plan that they okay. provided. They've given us an outline okay. of their their goals, and presumably, if they're seeking resources to accomplish those goals, then uh, you know, I, 
we would be in contact. I mean, we have a staff person who works closely with me, so we would be, you know, if, if we felt there was anything a fa that, that wasn't aligned with the city's general interest, then we would either address it with the committee or okay. bring it to the council, but there's there's nothing to prohibit that. Good, good, thank you. To uh, hopefully ease your fears, we won't make any leaps or make any presentations without letting y'all know what the, what the choices are? N no, I've just run into a lot of lobbying issues for other nonprofits, and I just wasn't sure when it came outside of the staff. But, but city appointed committees, what there were any other restrictions. That's all. Thank you. Um, on this topic, Chief Vegas, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, it's another uh, way that we're working to help support all of what, exactly kind of what you were just talking about. Um, Chief Bombardier and myself, Mary Moulton, had a meeting with a uh, representative uh, and working with also both from representatives from both Barry and Montpelier uh, on, for example, the uh, one of our mutual priorities is, is the embedded mental health clinician. Um, and also we have, uh, and we are trying to partner, <coughs> partner with the um, UVM Medical uh, Center as well. So we, we, we uh, are looking at a variety of how do we fund this, but, but certainly that is, I only th share that now because that is one aspect of how do we have legislative attention to exactly mental health su support and an effective um, substance abuse uh, you know, disorder support as well. So it's kind of, it's just another way without being direct lobbying um, and have the bills entered, uh, hopefully introduced uh, that, that way as well. So. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'd like to just mention, um, an interesting potential source of resources um, is are the hospitals. Um, in Burlington, there's the Harbor House, the converted hotel. It was the Champlain Housing Trust that did most of it, but it was also the medical center seeing that if you took their frequent flyers, the people who keep coming back to the emergency room, and you gave them housing, a lot of they will they save some money and. I mean, according to Will Eberly, this has worked in other jurisdictions. But I, I, I love hearing that these conversations have, have happened. Um, but, I, and I love, I mean, it's just another example of how all these different, there's so many people working in so many quarters on this. Um, so it does, again, back to that synergy. So if there aren't any final questions, I did want to ask a clarifying point so I just understand that you all are comfortable with us letting Good Sam know that they have funding available to them if they have the ability and staffing to stay open in the spring, up to the $10,000 limit. Um, that is my understanding, but I mean, one, um, we, we could vote on it again, just to clarify. I, it doesn't I, hurt, but yeah. Um, I mean, one other possibility there is that we should just check the language of um, what we approved um, to see if this uh, fits under uh, under that previous motion, uh, and if we need to make another motion, we can, or we can just preemptively just do it. We could just have another motion to um, uh, authorize, uh, you know, up to the remaining um, ten thousand dollars to open the shelter. Uh, later uh, in the spring, but that's uh, up to you all, or, well, or something. Well, I think the previous motion was very definitely r related around November, yes, we'll up to a certain amount, mm -hmm. and so I can make a motion that we allow the remainder of that ten thousand dollars to apply to the spring of two thousand and twenty. Second. Great. F uh, further discussion. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Great, thank you. Thank um, you, I do appreciate it. Yep, Thanks. motions are good clarity. Um, and uh, so uh, I guess I have one other question about um, the plan here. Um, so I, this is, first of all, this is just really awesome. wonderful work. This is, this is amazing. This feels really, um, there's clearly been a lot of time that has uh, gone into this. And, you know, just as, uh, you know, as, as it comes to um, trying to implement some of these pieces, I sort of assume this is, you all may be coming back to us on a sort of a rolling basis because some things may be ready at different times. Um, you know, as, as you sort of focus on one, one thing, you know, if it's the lockers first or if it's, uh, you know, some, something else. Um, 
yeah, so anyway, I, I guess that's all to say. I'm looking forward to hearing whatever you know, proposals you all have um, moving forward, knowing that we have uh, some you know, limitations on our, our budget. But even so, I think we can, we can do a lot. So. Thank you, and, and we will be back. Don't worry. OK. Um, so I would just like to insert that I'm hoping that, indeed, you're not seeing the city as the only funding source here. Not at and all. that, again, we're really good about matching money. And so anytime you can match money and come with us with grants or other stakeholders that we can support, uh, but that it really has to be a, a bigger whole support than just the city. Yes, thank you. And I just, I just one, more, one more thing. Um, so um, it, I lived in California um, for a number of years. And I know this guy who's actually this mayor of Sacramento. He's the head of their task force for California. And Daryl Steinberg is his name. And he was on NPR. And he was talking about because of that ruling in Boise, Idaho, where you can't camp, they can't ban yep. camping unless they have shelter space. A lot of Western cities are mustering. He's going for subsidized housing. It's like nobody should be living outside. And then the NPR interviewer is like, well, you know, geez, what do you say to people? It's like, well, you know, that's not the business of the city to be doing that. He's like, well, these are deep problems, and we really have to stretch. And uh, not that, not and and, but also other sources, yes. But it, I, I think in terms of what, you know, to really look at the problem, bigger picture, it, it's just worth seeing what other people are doing. And I, I'm not, and I'm not recommending anything specific, but it's just there. There is a lot of action on this, um, and so there are a lot of people out there like really looking, and so balance between prudent stewardship of resources with 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 vision so thank you uh, and Glenn yeah um, I just wanted to uh, bring m my perspective as the uh, council's representative to the homelessness task force <coughs> and use it to underline something that that Ken started out with he said that uh, he was talking about how valuable and enjoyable he finds the, the, the task force meetings. And I have to say, uh, Ken says he starts out anxious. I am anxious through the entire meeting every time. <laughs> um, and n not to say that it's, it's all bad. They're, they're really extremely valuable. Um, and I also, I, I just want to, to, to emphasize that these are, this is an emergency, uh, and it's issues that, that people on the committee are dealing with day to day. People come to the committee having slept outside the night before in the, in the freezing cold. And we do not agree in the committee on everything, and we step on each other's toes, and we argue, and we fight. Um, I think that, that one of the <coughs> things that I have really appreciated about it is that um, because we meet weekly, uh, and because we've had some time with the same cast of characters fighting and coming back, uh, we have really been able to build some amount of trust. And I think that we're, we're succeeding um, for those reasons uh, in making those quick connections for the, the little things that individual people can, can jump on day to day and hopefully, yes, in the future, come up with something more systemic. Um, but I think that uh, this meeting uh, is so wonderfully calm and warm and, and kind of easy that uh, I, I want to, to emphasize for the council that it is as the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee was talking about before, these are things that, that are hard to get into. So thanks for your support and all of it, and thanks for you to doing the work. Wow. I'm just so impressed with, with you all and your work and the, um, yeah, just digging into hard things. Thank you. All right, so um, <laughs> we're going to come back from our break. I did already technically open them public hearing, which is kind of funny, to open the public hearing and then take a break. <laughs> well, if I didn't before, I'm opening the public point. hearing. Uh, okay, so this is uh, Chapter 13, Natural Resources. Um, comments, questions, thoughts? Go ahead, Jack. I did have uh, a number of 
things that I noted, and I wonder if uh, if you want to just go through the whole thing in order and just yes. grab grab them as I, they come up. Uh, sure. Uh, so if we just walk through this um, sort of sequentially. Anything on this first page? Let's see, we can do it by page potentially. 13.1, 13.2. Thoughts um, on that? I uh, do have a question about this actually. Um, and I'm disappointed in myself for not already having the answer. Uh, but I did look and I don't know. Um, on page one, where did it go? It just disappeared. Uh, where the section where it talks about. Um, Berlin Pond, uh, it goes on to say that subsection B, a violation of this ordinance shall be deemed a misdemeanor. A person violating this ordinance shall be subject to a fine to exceed $500 and subject to imprisonment for a term not to exceed one year. Uh, do we have a city attorney that would prosecute that? Um, I don't know if we do, and I think some of this may have changed with the result of the court case as well and some of the state actions. Um, I, I almost wonder if, well, let me wake up. At one, one pass on this might be, well, we don't really have this jurisdiction, so we should take this out. Um, another possibility is that we don't, we don't think that the state um, really, well, we don't want to give up our authority here, so we leave it. Um, and so that's kind of where, where I am. If we want to change some of the, the fines or the language or whatever, I'm fine with that. Donna? We certainly have authority on the property we own. Yes. It's that little segment we don't and how people get access. Okay. Um, I, would, I was really worried about any change because that's how we got shafted in 1976 was a nice little tweaking and it destroyed our authority. Mm -hmm. uh, Glenn? Um, I, only because I heard it when Ashley read it out loud. Uh, should it be subject to a fine not to exceed five hundred dollars? No, they want it more than five hundred. It should be more than five hundred dollars. That's, that's, what that's it says. intentional. Yes, to exceed five hundred dollars. It's a yep. strange okay. way to write it, but basically, it's a mandatory minimum of five hundred, and sky's the limit. Okay, cool. Yeah. Which yeah. is probably a problem. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> I've just never seen that formulation before, so I don't know. Yeah, I think that's a typo. I think there's a not that be that should be in there because you can't say something. Well, five hundred or Whatever. any amount beyond five hundred dollars, including fifty million dollars or more. It's a tricky one. <coughs> true. So I move that we insert not there. Because I, I think it was a scrivener's okay. error. I mean, we could put in not and then raise the number. <laughs> when was the last time the city prosecuted? I mean, and the last time we prosecuted, we end up in the state supreme court, court. challenging our authority to prosecute. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, so this might be something to get an opinion from the city attorney on. <laughs> Donna, what are you? What are you thinking? No. no. Okay. Fair check. enough. I just, I, the only reason I say this is because I'm not actually sure that, um, I don't know that the city could impose a jail sentence. Why don't we just take that out and say, how about we just say subject to a fine of $500, period. Period. Sound okay? Thoughts on, any other thoughts on that? <laughs> lawyers tweaking there you go it's all lost <laughs> fair enough um, any, any other further thoughts on page one yes Jack actually I said yes that's fine with me but I, I this is the first public hearing before I really say yes to that I want to think about that a little bit I don't know that the city <coughs> acting within uh, its authority under its charter can't create a, a penalty that includes imprisonment. I don't know one way or the other. Obviously, it would be the court that actually imposes a sentence of imprisonment, and that's certainly within the uh, jurisdiction of a court to do. So I just want to say, I, I'm not ready to say yes, definitely. Fair enough. 
Okay, any other comments on this first page? Okay, uh, moving on to the second page, uh, encroachment on the river. And I, I think, Glenn, you had some comments about the phrasing of that, am I correct? Yeah, uh, <coughs> don't know where I put my notes on that, but basically, um, I think I was uncertain of the the proper term to use encroaching. I think that what what's meant here is like building something or or uh, extending some mud or land or something into the river and changing its um, course. But to me. Uh, an individual person could encroach on the river by wading in it or like walking into it or something. And just to avoid that, because I like wading in the river and I don't <laughs> want us to prevent that, uh, I would like to suggest that we change that language. Um, I'm sorry, Bill, do you remember what <laughs> word I used in, instead of encroach? You, I think uh, you said alter. The course, alter the, yeah. alter the, the course one way or another. I can find it. But it's more than just the course. It has to do with also the vegetation or moving dirt. I mean, this is a term that comes up a lot in the river conservatory elements. So I, I, I don't know the proper definition. I just know it's very common when dealing with riverways, waterways. We could probably ask them. Um, and I think I can find my email. So let me, I'm sorry, I wasn't totally on top of that. Well, maybe we, since this is just the first public hearing, maybe just flag it as like finding um, either clearer language or, or maybe we, we define it, maybe we spell it out a little more, perhaps. But I um, did a, a, go ahead, appreciate yeah. the staff saying any river, all rivers, because who knows? I liked, I liked we it. We could have more rivers. Yeah, that's right. Who knows? <laughs> In the future. Uh, uh, Lauren. Um, I was just looking up, and it does look like the Department of Environmental Conservation has, they've got a whole fact sheet on what is encroachment um, that is mm -hmm. a term of art, it looks like, describing advancement of structures, roads, railroads, improved paths, utilities, and other development into natural areas, including floodplains, river corridors, et cetera. So we could copy and paste that if we want to define it, or just assume that it's a term of art that means something to people who work in the river world. I would accept that. I'll, I'll read it, but it sounds sounds like it probably. I'll send the link. Yeah, thank you. Great. Other thoughts on page two here, or article two, really? Um, oh yeah, Jack. Um, on thirteen dash two hundred one, where it says all rivers, I think it should be any river. Because if it's all rivers, then you only violate it if you <laughs> if you put garbage into every river in the city. Oh, really? That is a good point. <laughs> um, I wondered with this one, and I think it might. Um, I'm trying to remember if it comes up later. Uh, I had wondered about the. Is there any? Actually, I guess this is maybe true for other aspects of this. Um, the violations of of this, I guess, are well. It, it's not clear to me what the what the consequences are um, for something that doesn't specify what the consequences are. Uh, does the police force just potentially write a ticket and they just get to decide how much that ticket is I, for? I think what is how does that work? Um. I, Don and I were just talking about this about a different thing, but the idea is that there are general penalty provisions of, in the ordinance for all sections of the ordinance, and it does kind of refer to this under 13-2, but, it, it, but it seems to narrow it to only section 13-1. 13 13 yeah. I mean, I think we could just say anyone found to be in violation of this chapter will be subject unless otherwise noticed, unless otherwise determined, like in the next one where we have a specific penalty. Mm -hmm. I guess I would just make a note that I think it would be useful to have some notation as to the consequences of violation of, of this or perhaps on the encroachment, et cetera. Right. Well, the, I, I mean, again, I think the idea is that there are there's a general provision for penalties of okay. ordinance violations, and any of these fall into that unless there is something in particular we want to either make 
you know, higher or lower, mm -hmm. or like in the case of the dogs, you put the, the restorative justice process in and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So, f but because it's, there is um, a specific uh, code referenced for, uh, in 13.2, um, mm -hmm. I yeah I I suggest and this is without any forethought instead of saying to be in violation of thirteen dash one I just say to be in violation of this chapter, chapter. or chapter yeah. thirteen okay. or something like that okay and, and then maybe add unless otherwise noted which because mm -hmm. then thirteen dash three we're gonna lock them up okay I'll, I'll Jack's gonna lock them up anyway I'll, I'll look at that stuff for, uh, great for next time. cool thank you. Right, any further comments about uh, Article 2? Okay, so moving on to Article 3, trees. Uh, these suggestions all came from the tree board. Tree board. Just so you know. I, I do have a couple <laughs> of uh, comments on this. That's where most of my comments are. Um, one is in 13-306. <laughs> which is a list of street tree species to be planted. And I just wonder, does this need to be in the ordinances? So I had that same thought, and I emailed John Snell and um, Lynn Wild and said, well, first of all, I was like, there's no, there's no fruit or nut trees in here. And that's kind of sad. But uh, they, they, they said, well, they're not always appropriate, but um, my other suggestion was like, well, could we just not leave that up to the discretion of the tree board? Why do we have to spell it out? And he thought that would be fine to have it just be at the discretion of the tree board. You don't think so? Trust not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, Donna? Well, that, that's what I was wondering. Why have a list? I mean, we've learned the hard way, and next month we may learn another tree is not yeah. infallible. So I would prefer not to list it and put it under the tree board. So I'd work to delete 13306. Yeah. Was that, yeah, a second? Yes, a second. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, would, um, I would actually uh, say something along the lines of uh, street tree species to be planted are, to, are, are determined by the tree board. As opposed to taking it out completely, I would just say that that's the group of people that are responsible for doing it and then take out the list, not the whole section. The tree board and concurrence of the city, uh, the city tree, tree board. board. Sure. Yeah. That's okay with you. How do you feel about that, Jack? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so, well, yeah. So we need actual language for the clerk, and so, uh, <laughs> so I will come up with language for that next time, or before our next time. Okay. And that's going to impact 307 and 308 there, because it refers yep. back to it as far as the small, medium, and large trees. Yep. Um, well, I have more thoughts about those sections too. I'm sure pr probably Jack does as well. Mm -hmm. But um, there is a, um, Lauren, um, and then um, maybe we'll vote. Um, just wondering, and I mean, it looks like they it's not necessarily in here. Like, do we have any preference for like native trees or and, and ginkgo? Doesn't seem like it's a Vermont native, but so maybe it's just hard. Well, uh, I don't know. It seems like the native. I species. don't have a lot of expertise on this, but I believe <coughs> that the the list of trees are those that survive the best on in, native trees don't survive the best <laughs> in, yeah. in urban it, well, conditions on, on, in paved yeah. roads yeah. and those kinds of things and, and with cars and salt and those kind of things so I think the idea was to be, A, be consistent throughout the city and B, have those that have a chance of surviving versus they did take out the Norway maple like up above the ash, because of it was it worked differently and actually opposing to the local sugar maple and it has its own negative characteristics. Mm -hmm. So I think when it was possible, they went there. But when it wasn't, they found other trees. OK, so um, there's a motion in a second. Clerk crisis. Yes. Um, I had thought that I had assumed that the motion had been withdrawn because it was going to be changed to include wording that I would not receive until the next meeting. Correct. Right. So Maybe can't really just... vote on it because there's no wording. Okay, so show. Are you, we Six were drop hole. Yeah. We're just, okay. There's 306. We're going to do. Something. Okay, so yeah, you're withdrawing your motion. Yeah. We'll vote on it next time. Okay. <laughs> just want to be gonna clear. That's going to be a good one for me to fake. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to see where there's interesting stuff in the minutes. Oh, dear. 
Okay, so given that we are probably going to be... But you know, you don't range. necessarily have to change 307 and 308 because they still could be in small, medium, and large characteristics. You're just not listing yep. them. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair. Um, thoughts Except on the, the, the rest of this? Uh, let's just deal with this page for now, I suppose, with spacing, distance, uh, from curve, distance from corners, etc. <clears throat> I prefer to keep those. Okay, I'm uh, Lauren. I mean, it just seems like we'll need to clean up the, in accordance with the three species size classes right. listed, or we just have to put the words "these shall include small, medium, and large trees" or something in the rewording of thirteen three hundred six. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yep. We have to mix those. Just my initial reaction reading through this, I was like, why? Are we getting this specific here? Does it, should this not be in something like, you know, does it make sense to have this in the zoning or, or whatnot? But I'm convinced now that it's fine. <laughs> Unless other people have suggestions, yeah. Well, I think it's because it hasn't always been obvious, yeah. and so they've run into problems and in trying to keep it here so we won't run into problems. Okay, that's fair. And zoning wouldn't necessarily, these are dealing with public street trees that the city themselves are going to put in, by and large. And so mm -hmm. that wouldn't necessarily come up through a zoning application sure, for a fair. private. Yeah. No, that makes sense. OK, so uh, moving on to uh, the, the next page of this uh, article, uh, Jack. On uh, section 13-315, I noticed that it talks about uh, trees overhanging streets or rights of way, but uh, it doesn't talk about <coughs> other plants. And there are certainly other plants that could, uh, by their growth, create uh, a, vi a visual uh, screen. And so I propose we um, amend the first sentence by inserting after the word tree, comma, shrub, comma, or other plant. Yes. I live by one. <laughs> I'd like to have that there. <laughs> um, that's Bush that I like to kill. <laughs> seems fine, though. I'm trying to find it. I, we had, oh, it's in the Definition. definitions. Mm -hmm of uh, street trees, that a street tree is defined as trees, shrubs, bushes, and all the woody vegetation on either side of all streets, blah, blah, blah. So one possibility is that that's, uh, I mean, it, it, so trees here includes shrubs and bushes, uh, other woody vegetation. I mean, that does not necessarily include all plants, which could obstruct one's view, I suppose, but Hmm. I think that uh, 315 isn't limited to street trees. I think it's limited to any tree that's uh, e even privately owned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, does, it doesn't use street tree in it. Okay, that, that's fair. Any vegetative growth. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. So, so let's, how do people feel about including the other types of... <laughs> Planty words. <laughs> Vegetative that a, growth. Uh, yeah. Okay. We'll we'll try to include that, I suppose, for next next time. And, uh, moving on, any other thoughts on uh, this page of Article uh, Three? Well, there's one on thirteen three eighteen, and for some okay. reason you made trees possessive. And in another place, that same phraseology, it's just parks and tree staff, not trees staff. <laughs> just the staff of the trees. <laughs> I know. The one you serve us, humans. Yeah, I think we could take that out. These the are not the trees you were looking for. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, I'm just going to move on. Any other thoughts on this? Oh, yeah, Lauren. Oh, yeah. Do you, you say that again? I couldn't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, there's there's a specific license fee, and 
Sometimes mm -hmm. we put those all in the license chapter, the license fee chapter. Sometimes they seem to stay. So I was just flagging it if we wanted to. I, I would appreciate those things being all in the license chapter. I, I never would have noticed that. I thought you were my attention to it. Uh, Jack. And consistent with that, and consistent with my role as licensing guy, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> my suggestion would be, you know, this is another one of these things where we have the city in the business of issuing a license. We're not giving the city or the city clerk any standards for how to decide whether to issue the license or not. My proposal is to get rid of the city license and instead of doing that, say, after the word city in uh, the second line, delete without first applying for and procuring a license, the license sheet fee shall be $15 annually in advance, and inserting instead, unless that person is an arborist certified by the International Society of Arborists. Vermont doesn't license arb arborists, um, so, but the ISA is the uh, recognized authority that tests people and uh, uh, certifies them, and this is only for uh, people who are doing street and park trees. It doesn't say that but people... But nobody should do street or park trees without permission. Right, but this is saying, well, who's, who's the who's city going to contract with to, to do it? Um, can you, you said a whole bunch of things. Can you just say it one more mm -hmm. time to uh, sure. clarify? Sorry, I could oh. use it one more time. Yeah, and, and John, I actually have this in writing. Oh, you want this as a motion? Well, no. well, well, for now, we're just talking. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> but this is what I'm... Okay, yeah, you can Actually, I'll pass this around to everybody, just... Oh, you've got it all written out. So you're saying this doesn't go by, like, the tree board or whatever to make a decision about who they're going to hire to take off the trees, um, street trees or park trees? What, uh, what I think this says is that this say, says two things. One, if city employees are, uh, are pruning, uh, <coughs> treating, or removing street trees or park trees, then they don't have to have a license uh, by, from the city. If the city is hiring somebody to, uh, to do pruning, trimming or whatever, uh, then whoever they hire has to have a license issued by the city. And what I'm suggesting is that instead of having a license issued by the city, we establish a standard that uh, the city only hire people who are certified arborists from the ISA. We actually do. It sounds fine to me, but... In fact, we have two certified arborists working for the city. Um, Donna? I would just want to have input from the parks and the tree parks board on it. That's okay. okay. Yep. Okay. I, I may be able to speak to the city arborist about that. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, okay, any, anything else? Um, uh, Glenn. Uh, the next section, uh, 13.320, uh, review by city council, that title is duplicated, so I think the, the section following that, 13.321, should be instead penalties. Mm -hmm. And uh, in th section 3, 3.321, um, I had a kind of similar question to an earlier question about uh, that language about conviction and plea of guilty. Um, maybe especially because it's, it's under what, what used to be review by city council for a bit. I was like, wait, are we accepting guilty pleas in review? And, and I don't think that that's what's meant. But I guess uh, it seems to me that maybe we could just delete that clause, any person violating any provision of this ordinance shall be subject to a fine not to exceed $500. Um, 
once we've changed it to penalties. I think it maybe just needs to say like penalty. And that might remove be any Because I know that there are certain kinds of things that the city council convenes to hear. I just don't think that it would be the imposition of like a, a, any sort of conviction because that would be a misdemeanor right. offense, which means due process attaches. And it could just be that the heading is wrong because the, the one above it is basically saying if someone doesn't like the decision of the tree board, they can oh. appeal it to the council. That's review by city council. The second one probably might just should be maybe saying penalty. Yeah, that's what Glenn is yeah. suggesting. Right. It's yeah. And that's the clause you were looking for earlier was. Oh, so yeah. Bill, you're saying that section 313.321 is like penalties that's for the, the whole chapter. That's clause. It's not, I think that's just. Interesting. It just it's lands the right heading. there. It's not the. The council gets to do it twice. Doesn't that sound familiar? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah, the, the council wouldn't be involved in that. Okay. City attorney hiring. Well, right. Yeah. Uh, are, are we clear on 321 then? Are we feeling okay about that? Okay. Uh, Donna? Yeah. I just had a question about the curfew. I, and I'm sorry to say that the Parks Commission was really busy last night with Mamba, and I forgot to bring this up to them, but has that been reviewed by the Parks staff, changing the curfew, 9 p.m. to 6 a.m.? Uh, this came <coughs> from them. This was went through Park okay. staff. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so we're on to section, or Article 5, uh, 13500. Any other comments on... Uh, this uh, something on this first page. Uh, go ahead, Jack. This is a general question about Article Five, not necessarily on the first page, but we have some ordinances on Hubbard Park and Summer Street Park. Is there a reason not to apply some or all of them to? the city's other parks, or have some, some standards for the other parks? I think it would be really helpful to have a curfew for, let's say, Blanchard Park. Um, I think that probably needs, needs a curfew. And disturbing the peace, uh, fires, uh, firearms, there's a lot of stuff that seems like we could Comprehensively, I don't know which of these should be applicable to all parts, parks, but it seems like we should come up with something for that. Right, so the, maybe there's a, a general thing for all parks, and then there are, some parks have more specific things particular for them. That, that makes sense to me. Um, yeah, I'm go ahead, just Ashley. a little curious. So the firearms prohibition makes sense. The destruction and littering, I mean, certainly there are criminal offenses that cover this. I'm just, subsection E, disturbing the peace, that's literally the, the text of a state statute that's just copied and inserted here. And it, it, it doesn't, a disorderly conduct is a disorderly conduct whether it's on State Street, Main Street, or in the park. So I just don't, I don't think that we <coughs> need it in there. It just, it's, it's redundant, it, it says what state law says. Um, and it's it's something that any, anyone could be cited for or you know cited into court or and any reprimanded by law enforcement whatever it might be for I, I just don't know that we need it as an enforcement thing here especially since we don't have like a city prosecutor who would be using our ordinances to prosecute so uh, do we have you know in our um, policing um, section do you know do we have a a, a reference to disturbing the peace. It is. It's 13 VSA. Right oh, okay. It's Sorry. a state it's statute. statute. Yeah. But there's probably okay, so a similar I see what you're saying. Yeah. ordinances as well. So we could take this out, and <laughs> disturbing the peace would still be a problem. Right. But here. I still sort of, I like something stated here, I guess, about a standard of behavior for parks, because people gather together, and they sort of forget they're, they're still in a public space. So uh, maybe it's redundant, but sometimes I think redundancy is good. Because they do post some of these things at the park. 
in their key. 13 BSA section 1026. Okay. A person is guilty of disorderly conduct if he or she with intent to cause public inconvenience or annoyance or recklessly creates a risk thereof. A, B, well, one, two, yeah. three, four, five. Uh, Glenn. Um, <coughs> only because uh, it's come up uh, in discussion a couple of times recently at the homelessness task force uh, that um, and we, we heard a, a little bit from, from Ken earlier about this <coughs> recent ruling in the Western states that uh, um, makes what they did to me illegal. Hi, Casey. Uh, that says uh, basically, and I'm, I'm fumbling here, but um, that police cannot prevent people from sleeping in a public place. If, oh, if there are not if there <laughs> are not shelters available provided by the Ashley, maybe you can clarify. Sorry, for yeah. Me. So I actually read the case that yeah. you're talking about, Glenn. And what the city there did was they actually convicted people of misdemeanors. So you know people would be sleeping in parks or wherever they were sleeping, and then law enforcement would rouse them, cite them into court. They would go to court, and then they would end up with a conviction for sleeping there, and those were the grounds upon which it was challenged. So I think there could be a, a literal reading that says, like, you can't prohibit people from sleeping anywhere, but really the crux of it was you can't convict someone, you can't saddle someone with a criminal history for sleeping in a public park. So you can sleep in a public park, the police just can't cite you for it. If that if that distinction makes sense. So the, the issue was not the sleeping in the park. It was the, the ultimate issue was law enforcement issuing them a citation to appear in court. So. How about targeting by mental health organizations? Crickets. Huh. Have a good night, everybody. You too, Casey. Casey. By the way, I'd love to know how much of your business Washington County actually does for you. That's a good question. Washington County Mental Health. To be continued, I'm sure. Probably. All right. Um, but yes. oh, you'll hear from me again. I think okay. just ultimately the court said you can't, you can't turn people into misdemeanors for sleeping in a public place. So the communities were prohibited from having ordinances and Convicted. And enforcing the right. ordinances, exactly. That was the issue. The conviction was a, the issue. But they could say, move park along. Closed. Right. They could say, park is closed. They can rouse you and say, move along. But they cannot convict hmm. you and label you a misdemeanant based on that. OK. Um, yeah. I guess I'm, I'm also curious, I think, to hear from parks and uh, maybe from the police. Uh, how park curfews are currently enforced or, or, or how they, they could practically be enforced. Um, I, I think that there's a lot, you know, I, I agree uh, in principle that uh, it makes sense to have general standards for public parks. Uh, I hesitate to um, expand regulation into uh, public parks that are, aren't currently uh, under curfews uh, without checking in and seeing if, if we can practically enforce that and what the, what the consequences would be. I also think that uh, some of these particular um, items, especially under Summer Street Park, feel kind of like you said, Ashley, uh, redundant to uh, state law, or just I'm not quite sure they're necessary. Why do we, why do we call out littering specifically in Summer Street Park? Littering is a problem everywhere, and and I don't think we need that. For example, uh, Donna. Okay, well, Summer Street Park has more restrictions on games. Have you seen the park? And it was also a land was given by the neighborhood uh, owners. So I think there and seemed to be a restriction of what the neighborhood wanted that park to be. Um, I don't know if that was before your time, Bill. Yeah, um, it's been there as long as I've been here. Yeah, so that's that park is right there among the houses, and so it does have some heavier restrictions than others. 
uh, summer. But I also want to bring up last evening at the Parks Commission, two women talked about the problem of abusive language of people sleeping in the park. And when they go for their morning run, they have to go by these three or four males, it happens to be in this case, and how how uncomfortable it is for them. And they have complained, and they complained again. And, you know, unfortunately, they aren't there standing with their cell phone to call the police. But um, my understanding is they would come, and if they were, if indeed she got them when the park was closed, she's coming by where they're just waking up in the morning run. So I know there has been some conflicts mm -hmm. with people and people sleeping in the parks. It's not resolved. Any follow-up thoughts on that? Okay, so um, other thoughts on this section? I mean, so one possibility, right, is that uh, we're gonna have one section for all parks and then some subsections for specific parks. <clears throat> um, not I'll, sure, yeah. I'll take on doing that and Could we, circulating it. Should we ask the parks and the park staff and the tree staff to take a look at the issues we've raised. Mm -hmm. They may want to even attend the next meeting. <clears throat> I think that'd be good. Yeah, and definitely. It would be good to ask them about what they thought about grouping them all, right. too. Yep. The only other thing that I would add to that section, I, I know that it's a neighborhood park, but um, team sports by children over the age <laughs> of 10 are prohibited. Like. I have worked with a lot of kids. That's football. <laughs> I've worked with a lot of kids in my career, and I feel like if kids are outside doing this kind of stuff, that's great. <laughs> and I want to encourage that, and I don't want to label an 11 year old who dare engage in a group sport in Summer Street Park to like. Yeah. It just feels like a very arbitrary distinction. The difference between 10 and 11 to me, the difference between 10 and 12, the difference between 8 and 11, I mean, it just, I understand that it's a community park, but I just feel like telling kids who are over 10, like, sorry, you got to go to another park to play is not really. I also don't really know what hardball is. Sounds so like it's, it's, sounds it's, so it's it's baseball with a hard ball as opposed yes. to a wiffle yes. ball or something. But wait, like doesn't hard baseball? Why isn't it just okay. Baseball? I don't know. <laughs> well, because you can they, remember they used to have the softer <laughs> baseball. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. But if you're 11 and playing with that, <laughs> Jack, did you have something? It's possible. You know, the, this is the the little park on uh, that's been scotch yard. donated. Yeah, it's very in strange. their front yard. It's it's very possible that. Uh, there were some uh, conditions attached to the uh, donation of land to the city that are incorporated in this. And I don't know that, but it seems like we should find that out. I wondered that as well. And it's really a pretty small area. It, it's Purposely, they planted trees, so you can't do some of the heavier things. You can climb the trees, but you can't do the kind of sports. The idea is actually preschools, young kids, a park for young kids. So I just, I want to, I'm looking at the, no, no, I'm just looking at the city website right now about um, Summer Street Park, and uh, it says no smoking in any Montpelier Park, yes. It then says no fires, comma, team sports for people over 11 years old. Oh, that's a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, so there's that gray area of between 10, <laughs> 10 and 11. <laughs> and, but the way it reads, like no fires for people over 11 years old, that also <laughs> probably is not the intended... <laughs> well, that's pretty funny. Sure, I'll trust some eight-year-olds for the fire. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> when, when, when they're young, how big a fire could they make? I mean, right. <laughs> exactly. I mean we didn't start, start the fire. I mean, my, so my head goes towards uh, just what what was the intent, and like, do they do they really mean no team sports and? I mean, maybe it's in the language of the right. provision of the donation, and we should find that out. And if it is, then fine. Uh, but, I mean, my head obviously goes to ultimate. Probably not okay. Um, soccer? Team sport? Probably not okay. But, like, teams... And I get that because 
uh, there are things that might be flying and or or loud, risk to I, yeah, but that's fair. Um, yeah. A risk to windows. I mean, part of it was the neighborhood accepting putting this park there. Okay. So I think there was some compromise. It doesn't mean that it's right or legal or whatever, but it really took some convincing. Okay. I mean, go and see this park. I mean, I used it a lot with my granddaughter when she was younger. It's a sweet little space. It's not so much a park as a space with a couple. Benches. <laughs> but but once you got once you got over ten, you couldn't you couldn't play your team sports there anymore. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like if there's a team of eleven year olds playing chess in the park, I want to support that endeavor. However, I can. Chess is an individual. I've game. never it's seen anyone sport. removed. You're on the chess team. Yeah, but you're still playing an individual game, <laughs> and it's arguably not a sport. My suggestion is that if we ask. Uh, parks and Trees to uh, comment and come to our next meeting. Ask them <coughs> to think about this too. Right. Okay. That would be great. Okay, anything else uh, in this section? Again, we have this uh, uh, potentially redundant section about disturbing the peace, but it's uh, that might be in something that if we want to have language there, maybe it's in the you know all all parks um, section. I I do wonder if uh, Blanchard Park n needs any more specific. Probably not. It's probably fine with that. Um, whatever provisions are applicable to all parks, but you know something to think about as well. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So I'm going to uh, officially close the public hearing. Um, and on to the winter uh, ban amendment for Sibley Ave and Prospect Street. So I think you've got the information about this. We talked about it last week. We just a couple sections we want to add that have been problems in the past. So and, um, we really should have caught this a little bit earlier, but uh, Sibley Ave from uh, Main Street, excuse me, Berry Street to College, that steep section, it's narrow. and. Uh, when you get snow banks, it gets crowded, so it's difficult to get vehicles through. And then there's one section, and I believe it was sent out to you, uh, an additional section of um, <coughs> Prospect Street. Close I don't have it right in front of me. I'm looking for it. Uh, 35 Prospect to 51. Thank you. That section. So uh, go we're, ahead. we're Actually, recommending that we amend the order. We, you know, we can call special bans at times, but our, <coughs> our ordinance actually does list all the places where they're it's banned all the time. Banned all the time. Uh, in, and in the, during the winter. And so the proposal is to add these, to add sections, these sections of the street to the all the, it's all the time. All winter. Yeah. Not all the time, but all winter. Sorry, all winter. Yes, thank you. Oh. Um, Ashley, go ahead. Do we know if the if the properties that these that this would impact the most um, have they received notice? And do we know how many of those are apartments and how many? Like, I, I'm assuming that spot on Sibley is like two or three spots that it would take up, and it is it's really rough to have parking there. I appreciate that, but I also know that those are apartments that are right there. And I used to live on that in Berry Street, and I know that a lot of folks rely on on-street parking. And um, so I just, I wanna be mindful that, I, at least those, those buildings on Sibley are apartment buildings, and they're multi-unit apartment bu buildings, and I don't know if they have parking. Did we notice I, folks? I'm not sure, I thought, thought we were going to, but I, we will have to confirm that. We'll get back to you. that was the plan, but can't tell you. And the types of housing we can check in on. You're right, though. I mean, certainly in Sibley, I counted there, there's four buildings, and they are at least three of them are multi family. Um, since this is an amendment to an ordinance, and this is um, the first, first public year. hearing on this, so, uh, so it's not going to change overnight anyway, right? So I'm going to officially open the public hearing on this, even though it's not listed. And uh, but it wasn't listed as. It wasn't listed as a public hearing. So this is true, but it is a change. Call it that? It's well, so that's amendment. So I'm that's just saying, process. can we say it's the first public we hearing? We didn't it public so we can do that. We can. Okay. We can warn it for Fair the next enough. meeting, first public hearing, if and then we can be certain that notice was provided. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I would feel more comfortable with that. 
And we'll have the first public, the, technically the first public hearing in the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. I mean, these are very narrow sections of road, so I mean, I get it, but I think it's good to have all that information. We can also make sure that the flyers say that there's going to be the public hearing at mm -hmm. this time, so yeah. those folks who will be impacted will know. Great. Um, uh, Glenn. I, I can say that uh, I live on Prospect Street, so uh, I know a little bit about the situation there. Um, <coughs> and uh, I've been talking with some of my neighbors about this proposed change, and I think they're likely to come to uh, a public hearing or at least to share some opinions. Most of the, the buildings on Prospect Street are single family and or have off-street parking, but there are a couple in this section that are multifamily and, and parking is always tight. I think that one of the, the questions that, um, that uh, my neighbors asked me to bring was uh, whether we might be able to have one more small uh, open parking zone through the winter down at the, the base of Prospect Street, kind of between numbers one and two, because there the, the road is relatively wide. Um, also, there are a couple of bulb outs further up the road that are often used for snow storage, uh, and I am sure that the plow teams appreciate them being there for snow storage, but if they could be used for parking, I think that, um, because as, I mean, absolutely, Prospect Street gets very narrow, and I know that emergency vehicles might have trouble getting through if we don't do something like this in some stretches. And as you say, Ashley, you know, apartments don't always have enough parking, and we want to try not to impact that. Well, and especially if you're already locked into a lease with the understanding that on street parking was what there was, and there's only a ban certain mm -hmm. times. Okay, um, so if, if there's nothing else on this item for now, um, so we'll take that up again next time. Uh, uh, do you need a motion to set the first public oh, hearing? Oh, good, but we sure. should just do it too. Way. Okay, if you don't need a motion, fine, but if you do. <laughs> Great, okay. Got it. We'll do it. Great, uh, all right, so that'll be coming up then. All right, so on to council reports. I've just gotten in this habit of calling on Donna first, but if you don't want to go first, that's fine. Thank you. Go for it. Unless you want to go, Lauren. That's okay. All right. Okay. So, Park Commission met last evening and had a very long meeting about Bamba, Mamba, uh, Montpelier Area Mountain Bike Association. They approved some additional bike paths. Unfortunately, I only have one map here, but <coughs> these are going to be online soon. Um, see all that yellow, <laughs> orange? Um, so there are going to be some additional bike paths for winter bikes on the North Branch, they did not approve the extension into Hubbard yet. That's going to be a discussion for the next meeting. But they are looking at and considering doing the, letting bikes be on the roadways in Hubbard. And these are the fat wheel bikes, particularly, for winter. Um, so, And the other thing, they also made a proposal to have some pump stations. They haven't decided locations, but they're going to be coming back to the Parks Commission for that also. Lots of activity with winter bikes. Right, I don't have too much. Um, unfortunately, on Saturday, I was telling Glenn, um, it was just myself and a very poor company, so I'm gonna give it another <laughs> round at Rabble Rouser, uh, one o'clock this Saturday. Other thing I'd say is I, I think other people have had a chance to sit down with Lisa Maxwell. Um, I, I think she's excellent. They're bringing a lot of good ideas to town, so make sure you get a cup of coffee or something with her over at MDC. Thanks. Um. I have had the pleasure of walking the Sibui Nebi path. Am I pronouncing that right this time, sort of? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, a couple of times. Uh, and I want to report, if anyone hasn't been through there yet, uh, it is being heavily used, and it's great. Um, Kate and I took a walk on the later end of a not great weather day, and uh, we saw probably 30 people and, and 15 dogs, um, and really fantastic. Um, I've also walked through the, uh, the middle of town stretch of path over the, the uh, new pedestrian bridge over the North Branch, 
uh, and down past the new transit center. That stretch is also being heavily used um, and really cheerful and beautiful. Uh, I think that we should um, make sure that it's uh, on the list of uh, pedestrian paths to be plowed and salted because it's getting pretty uh, treacherous um, and it, it feels like it is right in the middle of the city. I know that every stretch of more sidewalk to be plowed and salted is more work and I appreciate that, but I think that people are going to be using this stretch on foot in street shoes all the time regardless and we might as well clear it for them, I think. Uh, and I'll be at Baguito's tomorrow morning. 8.30 to 9.30. Thanks. Uh, Ashley. Um, yeah. I was at uh, <clears throat> an event Saturday night um, uh, for the Democratic Party, and there was a good representation of organized labor there, and many people, including many of the people who came and testified uh, here, but also other uh, labor representatives came up to me and they were very excited and appreciative about our passage of the Responsible <coughs> Employer Ordinance and they're planning on using it to go out to other cities and say, Montpelier did it, you guys should be able to do it too. So we got a lot of appreciation and I want to share that with you, uh, with you all. And that's all I've got. Okay. I just wanted to, one more time, thank everyone for the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee. Really excited to come back to you all with some good work and as um, we're able to hire a consultant and start a really robust and professional kind of engagement with the community. So look forward to that and just thank you again. Super. Uh, so I uh, announced today that I am going to be running for mayor again um, for a second term, so that uh, is out there now, which is great, sort of in an official capacity. Um, just so you're aware, um, what I said were my priorities uh, were environmental stewardship, sustainable infrastructure, and I, I mentioned specifically the possibility of reviving the capital area neighborhoods, um, and so... I'm hoping that we can have some conversations about that potentially uh, upcoming, um, perhaps in this upcoming budget, but we, you know, we'll see. Um, so just wanted, wanted you all to just at least be aware of that. And um, I, in addition to those things, I, I, again, just so you, you know where my head is at, um, I've been thinking a lot lately about the um, issue of food security. And the idea that I don't know that there's any, well, I don't, I don't know. Um, I know there at least is and maybe, um, well, there maybe was a group called the Central Vermont uh, Food uh, Systems Council. And I don't, I don't know uh, what they're up to and um, if they're still around. So I'm hoping to check into that. But um, just in the face of you know climate change, in terms of being prepared, uh, just having somebody uh, who's thinking about food systems for Central Vermont, I think would be a, a wise thing. And I um, don't necessarily want to wait for the state to be thinking about it. Not that we have a lot of resources necessarily uh, to um, to to uh, you know run it ourselves, right? But but just uh, you know w where are we at? What are the assets? What are the gaps? Um, just there, there's I think some interesting questions there. Um, so there's that, and then um, I'm finally getting myself organized um, to have uh, office hours. I'm finally uh, having a, a more regular schedule, which is great. Uh, so I'm going to be aiming to have office hours um, basically um, uh, Tuesdays and Fridays, 3:30 to 5 uh, p.m. Uh, starting December 6th. Uh, so I'll be here uh, in my office at City Hall uh, during those times. Happy to chat with anybody about um, anything that's on their minds. So um, just want to make people aware of that. And that is it for me. Uh, John. Pass. Okay. So if I talk for more than 10 minutes. <laughs> 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 What's writing <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. Uh, actually, and I don't actually have that much. Just a reminder that City Hall will be closed on Thursday and Friday um, next week um, for the 
holiday. Wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. We are continuing to uh, spend all our time interviewing, it seems like, <coughs> and uh, talking to some excellent candidates. So I don't know, if is we have, can I think of anything else specific to, I mean, we've touched on most of the things, so I'll leave it at that so we can, can hit our deadline. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, well, I think that is all of our business. So uh, without objection, we'll consider the meeting adjourned. Uh, 8.51.